going on guys, it's Jack Gelsey 75 here and today I'm bringing you the story of Austrian football and the Anschluss. Now this is of course the video you guys voted for on the Twitter poll, it was really really close, football in a divided Berlin just lost out narrowly, so you guys picked this video idea, I always love doing the videos you guys pick on the Twitter poll because I know it's something you want to see, it's something you'll engage with really well because I do this for you guys as much as I do it for myself because it's great to bring you guys football and stories and it's great to you know engage with your interests in regards to German and Austrian football and football in general. Um, on the channel, so it's good to sort of engage with you guys' interest as well. Now, before I jump into what we'll be talking about in regards to Austrian football and the Anschluss, I'm going to do a little disclaimer. First of all, there's some very painful history I'll be going over. When I talk about the fate of Jewish clubs in Austria, I will be talking about the Holocaust in Austria. If you find that too painful or too distressing, feel free to skip past that section of the video. I won't hold it against you, I completely understand why. Also, there's going to be a lot of Nazi iconography and talking about the Nazi regime. Where I've tried to avoid it, I have. Um, if I possibly could avoid it, I did. But there is going to be some pictures of swastikas and everything. I'm not using it as a political statement or symbol. It is purely for the history. I'm not glorifying the Nazi regime. I'm not sort of trying to discuss what the Nazi regime did. I'm purely talking about football, but to understand the football side of it, we do need to go into some of the history of the Third Reich and their occupation of Austria. So this is not a glorification of Nazism. This isn't anything trying to rewrite history. It's purely about football. So I need to get that disclaimer out of the way, guys. And like I said, if you find anything too um, painful, because there is some painful history, feel free to click off the video or just skip that part of the video. I won't hold it against you. It mostly will be about football, but like I was saying, we do need to discuss some of the history in regards to the Nazi regime, so we understand the football. Now, what I'll be talking about in this video is a short sort of explanation of what the Anschluss was, because you need to you know, like I was saying, understand that, to understand the football, the impacts on Austrian football at club level, how it impacted the national game, then the national team, talking about the different clubs and the different fortunes and how some Austrian clubs did better than others out of the Anschluss and then the legacy is left on Austrian football. So let's jump right into it. So what is the Anschluss? Well, the Anschluss is when Germany annexed Austria, when Nazi Germany annexed Austria into the Reich. Now, Anschluss is German for connecting. And basically, the idea of Austria becoming a part of Germany had really existed for quite a long time. When Germany was united under Otto von Bismarck in the 1800s, this idea of Grossdeutschland started getting banded about, that Austria should be part of Germany because they share the same culture and they share the same language. So that, that was that idea that Austria should become a part of Germany, but many in Austria didn't want it and many in Germany didn't want it. Specifically, the northern German states didn't want it. So it was sort of left alone, but there was that idea idea that Austria should be part of Germany. So Austria obviously had its own empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and Germany had its own empire, the German Empire. Now, this all changed after World War I, because we all know what happened in World War I, the Axis powers lost, and Austria was forced to break up its empire. They all became different independent countries. The Balkan states became the Yugoslavia, Hungary became its own country, and Austria became its own country. And of course, Germany's territory was significantly reduced after the Treaty of Versailles. So throughout the 1920s, a whole discussion was had about Austrian and German unification, which the Allied powers, Britain, France and America, turned around and said, nope, not happening. Then, you know, the 1930s time of political turmoil and a man called Adolf Hitler comes to power in Germany. Now, we all know about Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler comes to power in Germany, he's Austrian, and he says, you know what? All the German-speaking people should be united into one fatherland, one Reich. So, the Allied turned around and said, it's still not happening. Many Austrians weren't too keen on it. But then, Austria had its own fascist regime put in place. And the fascist regime in Austria, although many, including the president, the chancellor, didn't want it, but the fascist regime in Austria started overtures that they wanted the Nazis to come in and do this Anschluss, this connecting to unify Austria and Germany. So eventually it did happen and we're going to move on to talk about that now. But there's a little map just to show you, that's what Germany looked like in 1938. And you can see Austria, Germany absorbed Austria into the Reich and it could be talked about, it could be discussed. This was the first act of Nazi aggression and Austria are treated as the first victims of Nazi aggression. But we're about to talk about what happened 
in the sort of more political backdrop to the Anschluss. So that was a sort of overview, and I'm now going to go into some of the deeper stuff there. Now, as I was discussing just before there, the fascist movement in Austria had become very, very popular and very Austrian nationalistic tensions had been building up, and the fascist party in Austria eventually got into power through a wave of Austrian nationalism and a sort of longing to have the empire back sort of thing. Now, most in the fascist camp in Austria didn't actually want the Anschluss. Funnily enough, it was Social Democrats who in Germany were sort of the Nazis' arch nemesis that wanted the Anschluss to happen. And many other parties, both on the left and the right in Austria, actually wanted a unification with Germany. Now, of course, many didn't agree with the Nazi party, but at that point, nobody really knew what Hitler and the Nazi party were actually going to do, what their intentions were. And obviously the evils they went on to commit. Nobody knew they were going to do that at the time. And many Austrians looked at Hitler, they looked at Germany and went, we want this to be happening in our country. So they voted the fascist party into power in Austria, into the Austrian parliament, and they had a fascist chancellor. And many in Austria were like, you know what, I'm happy with the way it is, but then others in Austria were like, we want to be part of Germany. And there was a lot of to and fro. And at that time, obviously, Hitler had begun his scheming and wanted to take over Europe and make a big, new, impressive German Reich. So Hitler started making overtures to the fascist party in Austria, at this point to become a puppet of the Nazi party in Germany. He's making overtures, and we should have a Anschluss, a connection, a unification. This was the cornerstone of Hitler's foreign policy. He got elected promising that Austria would become part of Germany. He got elected in Germany promising that Austria would become part of Germany. And many Austrians liked the game that Hitler talked because, again, at that time, many people didn't know about the evils that he was going to commit. They liked the rhetoric that he was bringing out. It was nationalist, it was Germanic, and everybody liked it. Everybody in Austria liked it, or most people in Austria liked it. So as the 30s dragged on, more and more people in Austria were like, well, look at this Adolf Hitler bloke in Germany. We like what he's talking about. We like his ideas. And eventually, Hitler turned around to the Austrian government and said, right, you're going to have a referendum on an Anschluss, on a connection. And the Austrian government were like, we don't really like this, but okay. Now, it's up for debate how democratic this referendum was, but it happened. Now, funnily enough, the results of this referendum didn't go through the Austrian parliament. They went through the Reichskanzlerei, the Reich's parliament in Germany. So it went through Hitler's parliament in Germany. It did not go through the Austrian parliament. Now, like I said, there's sort of debate as to how democratic this referendum was. The SA, which of course the Nazi sort of intimidation, the Nazi muscle, if you like, the Nazi heavies were sent down to Austria to persuade people to vote for the Anschluss and in the end about 80% of Austrians around about there, there's no exact figures available, but around 80% of Austrians voted for the Anschluss. Now like I said, it's up for debate how democratic that was. It probably wasn't and a lot of intimidation was used. A lot of people disappeared that were against it and everything like that. So the Anschluss was democratically elected for it, but then on the 12th of March 1938, the Austrian police just opened the borders, the, all the border posts with Germany, and the Wehrmacht, the SS, and the Nazi police, the German police, the Ordnungspolizei, marched through the border and into Austria. So, I think, so effectively, Austria was invaded, but I think it was the most wanted invasion ever. When they got to Vienna, when they got to big cities like Salzburg and Linz, which was near where Hitler was born, there was cheering crowds on the street, people were doing Hitler salutes, they were waving swastikas about, and there really was an impression that the Austrian people wanted this, which is why it's really up for debate as to was Austria a victim or was Austria a perpetrator. There's a lot of complicated history that we're not going to go into in this video around that. So basically, the German army marched in, probably the most peaceful invasion the Nazis ever did. The German army marched into Austria, they marched through Vienna, everybody was Zeke Heiling and really enjoying themselves, but Austria didn't realise what was going to happen to them. So basically that was it. At that point, all Austrian government institutions were shut down, everything was centralised to Berlin, where Hitler was in charge, Austria was now a Gau or a region of the Reich, they were absorbed into the Reich, and Austria officially became part of Germany. Now, Europe's reaction was one of horror. France was like, oh dear. You know, France wasn't best pleased about it. Hitler's ally Mussolini wasn't best pleased about it because he wanted territory in Austria. Britain 
in the Soviet Union had a sort of indifference towards it, although they were getting worried, America wasn't really caring, but again it was like, what's this Hitler guy's intentions all about? Because nobody really knew about what Hitler was nobody really knew what Hitler was up to until the Anschluss happened and it sort of set danger, Europe on a really dangerous path that eventually led to World War II you could say the Anschluss was the sort of spark that light, lit the fire of World War II so basically that was it, Austria was no longer a sovereign independent country, they were now firmly part of the Nazi Reich they were absorbed into the Nazi government they had a Gauleiter instead of a Chancellor all power was centralised to Berlin and the Nazis began violently rounding up and killing anybody they didn't like Jews, Gypsies, Homosexuals, Communists, anybody that went against what the Nazis wanted they were being rounded up, taken to concentration camps, killed, tortured intimidated and that was that Austria was now part of Hitler's thiefdom and it set Austria on a horrible path that only ended in 1945. So that was a little bit of background to the Anschluss. There's a lot more complicated stuff apart from that, but basically I just wanted to get the basic facts out of the way. Austria democratically or undemocratically voted to get become part of the Reich. They became part of the Reich, realising the idea of Grossdeutschland. The German army did march in Austria, but it was the most peaceful invasion you're ever going to see. Austrians were relatively happy about it, and all power was taken away from Austria and centralised to Berlin, and that, that was it. They were firmly a part of the Nazi Reich, and like I was saying, it set Europe on the dangerous path with history, the dangerous course with history that eventually led to World War II. So that was a little bit of background to the Anschluss, so we're now going to go and look at what this meant for Austrian football at club level. Now we're going to look at the football inside of things when it comes to the Anschluss, what this video is really all about. Now, as I was saying, after the Anschluss happened, all Austrian government institutions were removed, they were disbanded, and they were taken up to Berlin and centralised. The same happened with Austrian football. The UFB, the Österreicher Fußballverband, the Austrian FA, was disbanded, it was shut down, and it was absorbed into the DFB. And any sort of football club that did not match what the Nazis wanted, any football club that was linked with communism or any Jewish sport clubs, and the one we're going to be talking about is Hakoa Wien, um, Hakoa Vienna, which is a massive Jewish sports club and Jewish football team in Vienna, was taken away. Now, we're going to talk about them later. That was disbanded. Anything that remotely went against what the Nazis wanted, football club was disbanded. Any football clubs linked with communism or social democrats, disbanded. Any football club like had links to the Jewish community in Austria, disbanded. And like I was saying, the UFB was disbanded as well, along with the Austrian national football team. So it, all Austrian football institutions were disbanded, the OFB was absorbed into the DFB and any football club that did not match what the Nazis' warped idea of society was completely, they got disbanded, they got taken away and like I said, they will be using Hakoa Vienna or Hakoa Wien much later in the video when I talk about what happened to football clubs and the different fortunes and look at individually. We'll be looking at Hakoa Wien's case and what happened to them as a football club. So now we're going to look at what happened once the OFB and football clubs that didn't match what the Nazis wanted were disbanded. So what happened to the football clubs that matched up to the Nazis' expectations? Because... The OFB has been disbanded at this point. It's been absorbed into the DFB. Well, they had to become members of the DFB. If that happened, they then represented themselves in DFB competitions, German competitions. So Austrian clubs have used Rapid Vienna and Austria Vienna as examples there, had to represent themselves in the German National Championship, which everybody knows about the German National Championship. It was the precursor to the Bundesliga and sort of worked on a similar format to how the MLS works today. It's different, but it's similar. It's same but different, if you like. Um, it's very similar to how the MLS works today. But they also had to play in the DFB Pokal. So basically, they were answerable to the DFB, the Deutsche Fußballbund, and they had to play in German competitions, the German National Championship and the DFB Pokal. Now, as we're going to learn later on, Rapid Vienna did very, very well out of this. Um, extremely well, in fact. Now, we're going to move on to talk about this just a minute, but it's something I'd like to add in here that... The Austrian national team 
was disbanded along with the UFB and all Austrian players were expected to represent Germany for a little while after the Anschluss. They did have their own national team in a little transitional period, but then they became part of the German national team. And we're going to talk about that just in a second. But any Austrian player was expected to represent Germany and they were expected to be German. They had to abandon all notion that they were Austrian and they had to answer the DFB and do what the DFB want. Now, of course, the DFB, by this point, was heavily politicised as well and was in league with the Nazis, so you had to match up the Nazi ideology as well to play for Germany. So that was the sort of immediate impact on club football. Now, I'm going to talk about Rapid Vienna later on in the video um, because they actually did quite well at the Anschluss. So I'm going to talk about another club called First Vienna as well. We're now going to move on to looking at the impacts on the national game and the national team the impacts that Anschluss had on them. We're now going to talk about the impact the Anschluss had on the Austrian national team and the Austrian national game. And well, the impact on the national team is immeasurable. You know, it really is. Now, before 1938, Austria were known as the Wundermannschaft, the wonder team. And I think that's a very accurate way of describing them. Any words I use wouldn't do them justice. They were absolutely fantastic, the Austrian team in the 30s. And they were called the Wundermannschaft for good reason. They were absolutely amazing. The leading lights in football in Central Europe. You know, nobody could compare them to anything. You know, they were better than even Hungary. I think Hungary were amazing back then. They were even better than Hungary, I'd argue. And up with the Hungary team of 1954 and the Holland team in 1974 and potentially the Holland team of 2010, it's the best team never to win a World Cup. Now, Austria were amazing at the 1934 World Cup, got to the semi-finals. You could say, unfortunately, lost to Italy and then ironically lost to Germany in the third-place playoffs. So Austria were like absolutely amazing in the 30s. You could compare them to... I'd say you could compare them to the Germany team of 2014 in terms of the football played and how good they were, but that's not even doing them justice. That's the closest you could make in terms of a comparison. The Germany team of 2014, definitely. A lot of fours going on here. So anyway, Austria were absolutely amazing, but then, of course, the Anschluss came along and that had, like I'm saying, an immeasurable impact on the national team. And one game was what was going to lead Austria's national team to completely be disbanded and put Austrian players in the sort of disfavour of Hitler, if you like. Um, and that's why not many Austrian players got into the German national team. Now, in the 1930s, this will be hard to believe, Austria were actually better than Germany. Like, a hundred times better. I know that's really hard to believe. Now, even the Germany team now could probably beat Austria now easily. And, and Germany aren't very good just now. But they were much better than Germany back then. Like, a hundred times better. So anyway, one game was going to change it all for the Austrian national team. Now, they did... They were allowed to keep the national team after the Anschluss, like I was saying, in a little transitional period, but this game is what completely ended it. So the April 3rd, 1938, Austria had a not-so-friendly-friendly friendly against Germany, their new overlords, basically. And a lot of top-ranking Nazi officials had made the trip down to Vienna to see the game. Now, the Austrian players have been told, obviously, they were answering to the DFB by this point. The Austrian players were told by the officials, whatever you do, don't beat Germany. A draw would be fine... A loss would probably be better for the cameras and everything like that and for the propaganda number. But whatever you do, do not win because it's going to anger the Fuhrer. It's going to anger Hitler. So basically, Austria were told they need to throw the game because Hitler wanted them to throw the game. And that was it. That, that was the end of the story. And Austria were towing the line until Matthias Zindela, one of their best players ever in the 70th minute, scores a goal. 1-0 up. Oh dear. Okay, maybe this is against the script, and he had been towing the line before, he'd missed easy chances deliberately, but he scores off a rebound in the 70th minute. Now, many could argue accidentally, but we'll never properly know. So, this is the 70th minute, Austria go 1-0 up. Okay, there's still time for Germany to get back in, there's still time for the um, propaganda number to work. But then, another one of Austria's star players, Sesta, makes it 2-0, and both players celebrate right in front of the box that is holding the Nazi dignitaries, where the Nazi dignitaries are sitting. And this was basically a big middle finger to the Nazis because both Sindelar and Sesta were very passionate social democrats and did not agree with the Nazis at all. So they both celebrated basically saying a big up yours to Hitler and we're an Austrian nation, we're not part of Germany. And this caused untold repercussions for the Austrian national team. Now, of course, the biggest repercussion is... 
and probably the, it's the biggest but not the most sinister as we're going to go on to discuss but the biggest repercussion for the Austrian national team was the fact that they just got disbanded that was it and Austrian players never really got picked for Germany after that at the 1938 World Cup there was like a handful of Austrian players but Hitler had completely went on to distrust them after that because of course they can't do a simple thing as to deliberately throw in a football game for the whims of a dictator so that was that they, that was them in big big trouble so Austrian players immediately fell out of favour with Hitler which is funnily enough given he was Austrian you know you think you'd be happy that your country won um, and the Austrian national team was disbanded and from there on in it was all about the German national team the centralised German national team but more sinister things were to come Zindala and Sesta both disappeared. Now, nobody really knows the sort of happenings of this. Many claim that a big black Mercedes pulled up and the SS bundled them into it and they were never seen again. Many have sort of theorised that they were killed in concentration camps, they were taken to a basement somewhere and shot. Nobody knows, but two of Austria's star players, purely for just winning against Germany, scoring goals that got them a win against Germany, were taken away and it's presumed they were killed nobody knows what's happened to them to this day we don't really know what's happened to them there's no records or nothing like that people assume either the Gestapo or the SS just came and took them away and that was it it was there's evidence heavily pointing towards Zindler died in a concentration camp but it can't be proved but anyway that's how far the Nazis were going to go and that's what led to the it just really impacted the Austrian national game a lot of the Austrian star players were then at that point too scared to um, sort of stand up to the Nazis a lot of them quit the game forever after what happened but Zindler and Sesta two of the Austrian I'd say legends were taken away by the SS of the Gestapo and never seen again and probably were killed somewhere either in a concentration camp or in a basement somewhere um, and that was really the most sinister side of the consequences of just purely beating Germany, that was it. They'd angered Hitler that much by beating Germany and just going, we're Austria, we don't agree with you. And that's how evil the Nazi regime really were. Just because two players scored goals, which is what footballers are meant to do, they were taken away and killed, presumably killed. Um, they were assassinated for all intents and purposes. And that's what Hitler did. And this sort of turn of sinister nastiness which was typical of the Nazi regime this taking out any form of opponent no matter how minor it was is what led to Austria's collapse and even today this sort of breaking up of the Wundermannschaft as a result of the Anschluss is still having impacts on Austrian football today and it's still a very painful subject for Austrians to talk about this sort of thing that they had their national team ripped away from them in really sinister and horrible circumstances that was what the impact on the Austrian national team was they had a great national team one that was lighting up Europe and indeed the world you know World Cup semi-finalists who would ever expect Austria to do that you know back in the 30s they really were the leading light they were very much like the Brazil of their day, you know, because Brazil weren't too good in the 30s, they really were the Brazil of their day, where they were just a really talented, solid team, but it wasn't to be, it wasn't to be because of the Anschluss, so the Wundermannschaft, sadly, was no more. We're now going to move on to looking at the different fortunes of clubs, and starting with Rapid Vienna, a club that probably benefited the most out of the Anschluss. Now we're going to talk about clubs that did well out the Anschluss and clubs that didn't do so well out the Anschluss. Now the first club that did well, and I think we could say they did very well out the Anschluss, was Rapid Vienna. Rapid Vienna, of course, the instantly recognisable name in Austrian football, probably even ahead of Red Bull Salzburg. Now the most successful side in history in Austrian football, they're very much the Bayern Munich of Austria, and in the 30s they were the Bayern Munich of everywhere basically, that's a way of putting it now, the Bayern Munich of Austria and Germany, really successful club, had some great players that we're going to go on and talk about and they did very well out the Anschluss like I was saying, they won a German national championship in 1941, so they were technically champions of Germany as an Austrian team, and they won the DFB Pokal in 1938, which was the first Pokal after the Anschluss, so they beat Schalke in the championship final they beat FSV Frankfurt in the Pokal final we're going to break those competitions down individually in a minute but we're now going to talk about Rapid Vienna as a team breaking down those competitions and why they did so well as an Austrian club within German football so we're going to talk about that now Rapid Vienna in the 1930s much like their own national team much like the Austrian national team were 
amazing. They were an amazing team. Rapid Vienna were very much like the Real Madrid of the time, if you like, in terms of how good they were in the sort of football they played. They were really, really successful. And when the Angelus happened, Rapid Vienna, like I was saying, really benefited out of it. Now, that's not to say they collaborated with the Nazis or agreed. They probably weren't all fanatical Nazis. There probably was a few in there that were card-carrying Nazi party members that believed in the cause and everything like that. But that's not for me to say. It's not for me to say whether they collaborated or not. That's for historians that know about these things to say. I'm purely looking at it from an on-the-pitch perspective, but I've just got to get out of the way that they did sort of not say anything and not bring up the issues that the Nazi regime were having, you know, they didn't bring up the evils of the Nazi regime, but they sort of had to keep their heads down to be successful. Plenty of clubs did speak up and it didn't end well for them. And it's similar to Schalke and Nuremberg. I wouldn't say, and I don't want to say that they were collaborators, but they did have strong links with the regime and didn't say anything against the regime, which is why they were so successful at the time. But Rapid Vienna were very, very successful in Austrian football pre-Anschluss. And when the Anschluss came along, well, the great team just adapted to German football really quickly. Now, I was saying about Real Madrid, I'd actually compare them to Bayern Munich more, actually. They were sort of like the Bayern Munich of the 30s. So they won the first day of Papal Cal, like I was saying, after the Anschluss happened in 1938. And that's what we're going to break down first. Now, it wasn't called the day of Papal Cal, it was called the Shammer Pokal, but I'm just going to call it the day of Papal Cal for like, continuity and everything like that. So... The Day of Papal Cal had a slightly different format in 1938. Now, Rapid Vienna, for some unknown reason, got a bye up until the quarterfinals. I don't know if that was for political reasons or not. But they got a bye right up to quarterfinals. Now, there was actually two quarterfinals that it's too complicated to explain. I might do it in a history of the Day of Papal Cal video, but for this video, just to get it out of the way, there was two quarterfinals. So, quarterfinal one, they beat Amatura Fiat Wien 5 1. So, they beat a fellow Vienna side, the team of the Fiat Factory, who were amateurs 5 1. Then went on to quarterfinal number two, where they beat Valtov Mannheim 3 2, a very impressive Valtov Mannheim team. They went to semi final and played Nuremberg. Now, Nuremberg were like the semi second best team in the country at that point. They're like Borussia Dortmund. They sort of took on the Borussia Dortmund role that they have now in the 30s. And they beat that very impressive Nuremberg side 2-0. So they got to the final and then in Berlin, in front of a German crowd, an Austrian team in Berlin beat FSV Frankfurt 3-1 in the final. Again, a very impressive FSV Frankfurt side who probably should have beaten Rapid, but Rapid were just absolutely amazing, played FSV Frankfurt off the park and won 3-1 in front of a big German crowd at the Olympia Stadion in Berlin. That is, just think about it, that's an Austrian team winning the Pokal in front of a crowd in Berlin. Now, like I was saying at the start, I'm not glorifying that time, period of time. It was an amazing Rapid team who did deserve to win it. It's just unfortunate that the backdrop to it was not very nice. But that was an impressive... Um, sort of win for Rapid Vienna it shocked a lot of the papers um, in Germany and Austria the Nazi leadership were quite happy because they viewed Rapid Vienna as a good Nazi club now like I said they, they're not they're definitely not but again you've just got to look at it in the context of the time and I've got to say these things for continuity so they beat a really impressive Everest for Frankfurt side as you've seen there they had a really impressive um, run to the final as well and lifted the day FB Pokal they then sort of had a brief spell of doing okay. They were really strong. Then along came 1941 and the German National Championship. Now, it would take far too long. I probably need another video to go through the full German National Tam Championship. Anyway, they topped a group consisting of 1860 Munich, Stuttgart, Kickers and Fautefeld Neckerau. Now, that's a really impressive um, performance to top that group, especially with 1860 Munich and Stuttgart are kickers in there. They then went on to the semi-final where they beat a very impressive Dresden SZ 2-1 and then they got to the German National Championship final and took on Schalke. Now Schalke were huge in the 30s. That was probably the most successful period for Schalke as a club. And Rapid Vienna beat them 4-3 in a very impressive game. It was probably great to watch the neutrals or just anybody that was there. 4-3 to win the German National Championship. That's right, in 1941, Rapid Vienna, an Austrian club from the capital of Austria, were crowned champions of Nazi Germany, of Germany, of the Reich, if you like. They were considered the Reichsmeister or the Imperial champions. So that was it. Rapid Vienna had won the German National Championship. So they had benefited really well out the Nazi 
era just purely by playing good football like I said I don't really want to bring the political side into it you have to for continuity but we'll never fully know what, why they did so well I think it's just because they had a talented group of players and they adapted really well to the German game how the German game was played at the time and that was that so they won a DFB Pokal and they won a German national championship so champions of Germany and DFB Pokal winners now if you want to learn more about the DFB Pokal win there's a huge big exhibition outdoor exhibition about it at the Olympia Stadium in Berlin so when restrictions allow go along to the Olympia Stadium if you can travel get there go to the wall you'll see 1938 Rapid Vienna read up on it if you know German it's excellent if you can speak German if not you can use Google Translate excellent story they talk all about it then you can go to the German Football Museum in Dortmund or the Austrian Football Museum and learn about when they won the German National Championship and the trophy's still there as well so I definitely recommend because from a footballing point of view on the pitch it's an excellent story obviously you got that horrible backdrop that the fact that Austria was annexed and everything behind it but Excellent football being played from Rapid Vienna. We're now going to move on to look at First Vienna, the other Austrian club that benefited out of the Anschluss and actually made a little bit of history along the way. The next Austrian club that benefited out of the Anschluss was First Vienna. Now, I was going to pick a few others, but I thought, you know what, if we talk about all of them, we'd be here all day and there's a few sections more to go in the video and I thought, you know what, just pick two. And I thought, first, Vienna would be a good one to talk about because they were a little club from Vienna. And to win the DFB Pokal, which is Germany's cup competition, is a huge thing. So they won it in 1943 against Luftwaffe Sportverein Hamburg. So that was the Luftwaffe football team. Now, in 1943, of course, it's the height of the war. Squads were depleted by, you know, men going off to fight and a lot of army teams had been founded and everything like that. Of course, they were playing part-time or they were army staffs, weren't like top footballers, if you like. So that might explain why first Vienna win. I'm not taking it away from them. Still good for a club like that to win the German Cup, the day of people kill. So that was at the height of World War II. And they made a little bit of history because the 1943 Pokal was the last one until 1952. It was the last one until well after the war had ended. The Day of People Kill didn't start again until 1952. And of course, East Germany had its own cup competition. So it's a video about the Anschluss and I brought East Germany into it. My bad. But anyway, um, first Vienna won this Day of People Kill, which was impressive. I've got to say, you know, Ellis V Hamburg weren't exactly a team to be sniffed at. I know they were a Luftwaffe sort of army team, but weren't a team to be sniffed at. Still had some good players, weren't to be underestimated. So first Vienna did phenomenally well to win this cup. So we're going to look at that journey and look at that more in depth now. Now, as we were discussing before, first Vienna weren't exactly a huge club. Now, they were relatively important to Vienna and Austrian football early on, but we're talking about the 1940s here. And not much is known about them in the 40s. None of their players are really known. Nothing is known about them other than they won a poke out. So they must have been a decent group of players. And like I was saying before, the war probably goes a long way to explain it. Now, football teams obviously consist of young men of fighting age. And in 1943, things weren't going well for Nazi Germany in the war, to put it lightly. They'd just taken a beating um, in the Eastern Front. The Soviet Union were beginning to sort of push back. Operation Barbarossa hadn't went to plan. And a lot of young men that would have been playing for football clubs that were a fighting age sadly went to the Eastern Front and never came back. Um, died in the harsh conditions when they were fighting the Soviets. On you know, the Eastern Front, the men ended up in the Soviet Gulag system, um, taken as prisoners of war. So a lot of the young men from football teams went off and never came back. Now, like I was discussing, they beat the Luftwaffe team in the final. There was a lot of army teams then, but we'll get to that. So they started off their day of people kill journey, probably not expecting to win it, and they ended up winning it. Now, like I said, you can form your own opinions on it. Personally, I think, and a lot of football experts from that know about football during the war and everything will probably agree that it was because of the war that they won. Um, it looks to me that they had a lot of older players or players that were from reserved occupations. Now, the other thing, big thing, is a lot of young men that were left behind were getting killed because Allied bombing raids were beginning to take their toll on Germany as well. So you can form your own opinions on it, but I definitely think it's as a result of the war that they won this Pokal. But anyway, they won the Pokal all the same against an impressive LSV Hamburg team in the final. So, you, like I said, it must have been a decent team and they won the Pokal nonetheless. They started off in the first round playing NSTG Brooks 
from occupied Czechoslovakia. Now, Brooks are from the Sudetenland in Czechoslovakia, which was a German-speaking area of Czechoslovakia. It was annexed not long after Austria, then the whole of Czechoslovakia was invaded. So Brooks are from Czechoslovakia, modern-day Czech Republic. And not much is known about them, but they mustn't have been very good because first Vienna hammered them 14-0 in the first round. So that's a great way to start off your campaign, if you think about it. You've come up against a team um, and you've beaten them 14-0, so you can only beat what's put in front of you. Now what you'll notice here is there's a lot of teams from occupied territories in the Pokal in 1943, like Czechoslovakia, like France, like Belgium. If you ever want to research any of this for yourself, you will begin to notice that um, very closely. Then in the round of 16, they played SPVG, SPVGG Breslau 02, or SPVGG Breslau 02, to say it in German, but that's a bit of a mouthful. Now, they are from Lower Silesia, and the Lower Silesia is in modern-day Poland, and Breslau is known as Wurzlau. I apologise to any Polish people that have offended with that mis mispronunciation there, but from there, um, they're from Bre which was called Breslau at the time. Now, Lower Silesia had been part of Germany before the First World War, so it's not technically occupied, but it's now part of modern-day Poland and has a Polish name. So they beat them 6-5, but that must have been a really exciting match. Um, beat them 6-5 um, for your, for a few race marks. You were getting to see an impressive game there. Um, getting to see 11 goals for your money, which is good. And then they played the hardest team. They, they sort of had the hardest game until the semi-final of their campaign in the quarter-final when they beat Nuremberg 3-2. So already first Vienna were making a bit of an impact there. They beat Nuremberg, one of the biggest teams in the country, 3-2. Again, was their squad depleted because of the war? Probably. Also, Nuremberg was getting very badly bombed at that point. Then in the semi-final, they played Schalke. The Schalke. Now, Schalke began to dwindle in the 40s again. War, probably a big factor in that. Schalke began to dwindle in the night, mid 40s, but they were still a really decent side. Well, first Vienna handled that very well and beat Schalke 6 2. I think that's just well, outstanding. And then they beat LSV Frankfurt in the final 3 2 after extra time. So, again, a very impressive game for your few rice marks to get into that final. They beat um, the Luftwaffe team 3-2 after extra time and lifted the day of people kill. Now, that is really impressive for First Vienna and I want to tie that in because it doesn't really have anything to do with politics. I don't, you know, it doesn't really have any links to the regime like Rapid did. They just played football and they won. In the backdrop of World War Two. they managed to win a Pokal. So I want to add First Vienna into that and just sort of talk about their story and winning the Pokal. We're now going to move on to a club that suffered really badly as a result of the Anschluss. And this is the part of the video that if you do want to skip it, I will not hold that against you because it is a very painful subject. So I'm now going to move on to that. Now this is the part of the video I really didn't want to do but I think it is necessary to talk about it because it is so important to Austrian football and so important to European history and we can't really ever forget it. Now if you do want to skip past this part of the video I'll completely understand you know it's very very painful and I won't hold it against you and before I'm not trying to sensationalise it or anything like that I am I think it is necessary that we discuss this and I see that figure at the bottom of your screens there. That is how many Austrian Jews are estimated to have died in the Holocaust. We don't know the real numbers. We, I don't think we'll ever know the real numbers, but it's estimated between 60,000 and 65,000 Austrian Jews were killed in the Holocaust on top of Austrian communists, Austrian homosexuals, Austrian gypsies, disabled people in Austria. It, it's it just it's horrible. And those... Uh, that's laid bare the evils of the Nazi regime. Now, I'd, I'd, like I said, I think it is really necessary that we talk about this. And it's, we talk about sport club Hakoa Fien, who were a massive Jewish team in Austria before the Anschluss. They were really successful and they really were a sort of focal point for the Jewish community in Vienna. Not just Vienna, but Austria. You know, Jews all over Austria supported Hakoa. They cheered them on Austrian domestic football and of course when the Nazis Anschluss to Austria when the Anschluss happened when Austria was annexed all the Jews rights were taken away they, they couldn't own businesses they couldn't go to the same schools as Austrian people 
they were segregated, they were forced into ghettos and then they were eventually deported to concentration camps and killed, either worked to death or executed, liquidated. And Hakoa Vienna as a club, this sort of really flourishing Jewish community, this flourishing Jewish club who were really successful on the Austrian domestic stage, they were really doing well in Austria, had so many talented players just overnight evaporated and, and nothing, they were banned under the um, racial discrimination laws, the Nuremberg laws, and it it really was profound in Austria. And even today, you know, Hakoa Vienna still exists. There's now another Jewish club in Vienna, Maccabi Vienna. They still do exist, but they play in lower league football, and that's because the impact of the Holocaust is still very strongly felt on these clubs. And like I was saying, you know, the figures are laid bare there, and I'm not doing this to upset anybody, I'm not doing this to sensationalise anything, I'm not doing it for my own gain, I'm doing it because it needs to be told, it needs to be said that these were young men that were playing football to promote their community at a time where Europe was a very anti-Semitic place and they did this to, to help their community and they were just taken away like that, you know, forced into trains, taken to Poland or other concentration camps like um, Sachsenhausen or Dachau and they were killed. And that is it, like I said, 60 to 65,000 Austrian Jews. That And like I was saying, you know, it, it's just, it's numbers you can't even comprehend. It, it's it's absolutely astonishing. And like I said, that might be more. It might be more, we don't know the real figures. And, and that I really wanted to bring this up because people could look at first and rapid Vienna and go, well, it wasn't all that bad for Austrian football. It was bad for Austrian football because they lost a club that was doing so much positive work for the Jewish community and had so many great young players that you don't know what could have been with these young men had they been allowed to live, had they been allowed to play football. So I think it really needs to be brought up. And for those of you that have made it this far, I thank you because we can never forget the Holocaust. They can never forget what happened. We can never let it fade from our memories because it... It is so profound. What it's it's words can't describe it. Words don't do it justice. What happened? And like I said, the figures are laid bare there. And Sport Club Hakoa Vien really sort of embody it, if you like. And that's that's it. You know. That I I I really just don't I really didn't want to do this bit of the video, but I thought it's necessary to talk about it, and it's so sad that such a great club, like I was saying, doing so much great great work for their community, showing that their community were important, that their community should be valued, just extinguished overnight because of some horrible people's warped view of the world. It's absolutely disgusting. So now that we've got this bit of the video out of the way, which I do think it was necessary, we're now going to move on to talking about the legacy. Of the Anschluss. So of course the Anschluss is probably one of the most important and profound events in European history. It kick-started the journey to World War II and the impact on Austria in general was quite a big one. I'm just sort of get that out of the way first. That Austria after the war's position was very vague. They were treated as a victim of Nazi aggression, as the first victim of Nazi aggression. But nobody really ever trusted Austria because a lot of Austrians were complicit in the Nazis' crimes and many sort of campaigned for Austria to face the same fate that Germany did, which was to be split and was never allowed to rearm itself or anything. But the Allies agreed to pull out of Austria. Austria built itself up as a democracy. It was not involved in the Cold War. They were part of the non-aligned movement. And now Austria is a flourishing democratic European nation with great friendly people. I've been to Austria before, I've been to the Tyrol, really friendly, great people, lovely country, um, Austria. So I do think Austria has moved on as a nation, but the Anschluss and the history behind it has left a profound impact on Austria and Austrian politics. And Austria's place in Europe and their place in history has sort of still been left very vague. So it's still left a stain on the Austrian nation, a scar on the Austrian nation that I don't think is ever going to heal. It's never going to go away. Now, talking about football, the huge bit is, and like we're talking about when we're talking about the Wundermannschaft, was, of course, the fact that the, the greatest football team ever was taken away and club football wasn't allowed to develop. So I think we'll talk about national team football first. Is the greatest ever team was taken away in an instant. Most of them quit football after what happened to their teammates. A lot of them stayed on but were made to play for Germany and then they lost a few in the war. When it came around to the 1950s, 
they were decent 1954 World Cup Austria were decent but after that apart from 1982 which is a story in itself Austria never really became the big footballing nation again that they were in the 30s and now Austria just underachieve, underachieve, underachieve. Now this year at the Euros, we see more Austria capable of. They had a great group stage campaign, I'd argue, put up a very good fight against that impressive Italy team and going ahead looking towards Qatar 2022, there is so much potential in Austrian football now. For the first time since the 30s, I think Austrian football is developing to a good point. So in terms of the Austrian national team, I do think that the the impact of the Anschluss, only now, you know, think about it, this is just under 90 years later, only now is the impacts of the Anschluss begin to fade. Only now are they beginning to fade. Um, And like I said, that's just under 90 years later that the impacts of the Anschluss are just beginning to fade. You know, they're just beginning to go away. You know, I think around, you're talking about 80, we're talking about, what, 80, seven years later after the last World Cup as an independent country before the Anschluss it's only just beginning to clear up now and they're only just beginning to develop as a football nation I'd say Austria are historic underachievers and now they're beginning to develop again as a football nation a lot of positives to be taken out it's a new generation and the thing that really overjoys me the most especially after what we talked about in terms of Hakoa Vienna is the fact that the Austrian national team now is so multicultural you've got David Alaba who is half Chinese half Nigerian We've got Eastern European players who Slavs were persecuted by the Nazis as well. So you've got so many Eastern European players like Drakovic and Arnautovic. You've got Austrians as well who are Austrians free from what happened there. You know, Austrians have grown up in a democratic free country and don't need to fear being killed just because they scored a goal. So I do think the Austrian national team now, it's great to see and it just really puts on show how far Austria has come as a nation ever since the Anschluss and it's it's great to see and I do think this Austrian team are so talented and there's so much going ahead for Austria. Like I said, going into the World Cup, so many positives, which is great given that we've just talked a lot about a lot of depressing history, a really dark chapter in European history just there. It's great to see that maybe some positives are beginning to come to light now and that the Anschluss is firmly in the past and the Nazis are firmly in the past, but we can't forget. And I think it's amazing that Austria have developed as a nation. It's great to see this Austrian team are fantastic and certainly there's a lot to s- more for them to see in the future and they're developing as a team really, really well. So now we're going to look at Austrian club football and the legacy and the impact that Anschluss has left on that. So now we're going to look at the impact on Austrian club football and I don't really think there is much of an impact the Anschluss. I do think it does leave a scar that won't heal, obviously. I think the biggest one is a lot of clubs like Austria Vienna, Rapid Vienna and a lot of the bigger clubs that were around at the time have got to sincerely look at themselves and go, we were involved in that, is it time to front up to history? Schalke have done it, a lot of the big German clubs that were successful at the time have openly admitted what they were up to at the time and have apologised for it. Austrian clubs haven't really done that. And I think that that's the biggest effect and legacy of the Angeles is a lot of the big old Austrian clubs have got to look at themselves and go, did we collaborate? Did we take part in this? Did we enable the evil, one of the most evil regimes we've seen in the history of the world? But like I was saying earlier on when we talked about Rapid, it's not for me to say, it's for history to judge. I don't really want to talk about that. I want to look at it from a football football in sense, but for continuity and everything like that, we have to. I do think that it has left its mark and a stain on the character of a lot of big Austrian clubs. But then again, they've went on and, I, and sort of been successful. Austrian club football obviously isn't the best in Europe. You get Austrian teams like Red Bull, Salzburg that do challenge... Um, in European football and make that what you may but I don't think the Red Bull discussion is appropriate for this video especially after what we just talked about in terms of Hakoa and everything like that I don't think it's appropriate with all Red Bull discussion but Red Bull Salzburg are representing Austria which regardless of their um, background as a team it is quite good to see an Austrian club fly the flag for Austria and Europe you've got the old Vienna clubs are still doing relatively well but most of the Austrian Bundesliga are either being refounded clubs or reformed clubs or are new relatively new clubs like SK and St. Pulten to use an example because the clubs that were around during the Anschluss have either went busted or reformed or whatever so I don't think 
were ever going to see the level of success that Austrian football had in the 30s again because of the Anschluss there's, there's loads of other reasons that like football isn't the most popular sport in Austria but the Anschluss has left a huge mark because the game just did not get a chance to develop and like I was saying with the national team a lot of their best players were taken away think about it a lot of young men died in the war and Austria was very badly affected by a Soviet American invasion as well to take it back so I think you can look at it like that that the Anschluss just it left an impact on Austria not just Austrian football and it left an impact on every sort of area of Austrian life you know Austrian people that were around at the time really got to look back and go what was our involvement here it's left an impact obviously on the Austrian Jewish community they've lost as you've seen the numbers there they lost a huge amount of their community um, due to the evils of Nazism and it, it just it's just left a huge huge impact I, I just don't think like I said I, I've said that a lot this video but it really is true because how sort of big this history is the, the sort of consequences of it that I don't think words can describe, really, or words can do it justice. But anyway, Austrian club football hasn't been affected by the Anschluss in many ways, apart from, like I was saying, the big clubs have got to look at themselves and go, what was our involvement at that period of time? So I'm now going to cut to the outro. So that concludes my video about Austrian football and the Anschluss. I think it's probably one of the most emotional videos I ever made. Now, I'm doing a bit of research into BFC Dynamo and the Stasi, which is, of course, another very sort of painful part of history, but nothing even comes close to this. The Anschluss really was the original Nazi sin, if you like. It sort of lit the spark, it was a spark that lit the fire of World War Two, And, you know, so many people suffered in Austria as a result, as you've seen when we talked about Hakoa Vienna, and I want this video to sort of help you guys remember them. This video is sort of dedicated to them, if you like, and everybody that suffered under the Nazi regime and everybody that was a victim of Nazism. We can't let it happen again. Now, this video, like I was saying, was really emotional research. It was also really interesting. I think the effect on a whole nation in terms of football that the Anschluss had was really profound. And you did have the winners like Rapid Vienna, but in most cases Austrian football suffered. The national team suffered. They had their Wundermannschaft cruelly ripped away from them. Two of their best players went disappeared because they scored a goal. You know, they scored goals. Like that's what they're meant to do. They scored goals that were taken away. That that was what the Anschluss did to Austrian football. It probably ruined Austrian football. If it wasn't for the Anschluss, we could talk about Austria in the same sentence we talk about Brazil or Argentina. You just never know. And I think the impact on club football, again, it does, it, you really just can't tell. But you, know, you had the winners like Rapid, you had the clubs that suffered, like Hakoa, that because they didn't fit in with the warped worldview the Nazis had, it, they just got extinguished. That was it, taken away. And I, I think that is the Anschluss in essence of what it did to football and what it did to the world. So you know, I, I did this video not to upset anybody, but to educate. When I saw this was the video you guys wanted to see, I was really sort of emboldened to do this so people can know the history and know not just the impact on football this was always going to be bigger than football but the impact it had on the world the impact it had on Europe and, and that's really what I wanted to do so I did this video to educate but also did it because it's so interesting in terms of football obviously and I've tried to focus on football as much as possible now before I go I'd like to say that any again reiterate that any sort of Nazi iconography in this video is purely for educational purposes. I've avoided it where I can. I hope you enjoyed the video, guys. Please remember to leave a like. And if you're new, please subscribe. I'll see you all in a while. Jack out.